Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Um, I know you come to church, you come especially to, to, to learn, to study, to be encouraged and edified. And uh, this morning I'm going to be just a, a little bit heavier than just the uh, normal kind of edification and encouragement. There's some things I want you to think. We're in Ephesians chapter 6. And there's some things that are, that are in this passage that relate to what's going on in our world today. And I say our world, I don't mean in general. I mean in, in, in our culture, what you're seeing on the news the last couple of weeks, there's some things here that speak to what's happening there. And I've talked to you about these things for, for a good while in, in a general sense about how uh, the, the, the world, the culture that we live in is changing and so forth. And I want, I want to spend a little time this morning um, thinking through some of this with you uh, so that you, you can see some of these, uh, the, 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 these issues that are there. They're broader issues than just me, you, and what we have to do tomorrow. They're cultural kind of issues. And there's some things that, that the body of Christ is facing in the world, in relationship to what's happening in the world. I've talked to you often, probably for the last 15 years, that this decade we live in right now is the most consequential decade you will live in your lifetime. It's the cycle of how a nation operates that makes it so. This year actually is the middle of that decade of change. And you can see the unraveling that's taking place in the world about us. Sometimes we, we're so close to the trees we don't see the forest. And I want you to kind of back up with me this morning and try to get a, get a picture of the forest that we live in, and not just the trees that, we're, that, we, that we deal with each day. And I, I say that because Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now we're looking at verse 16, Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. I've been talking to you about those fiery darts. They're designed to, to, to sear your conscience and take your thinking away from what God says and have you operate on something other than God's Word. The shield is your personal faith determination to believe what God says and apply that to your life and to the circumstances of your life. But you see how when it says this, the fiery darts of the wicked, well, that takes you back to verse 12. And he talks about the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. There is spiritual wickedness that runs the, that, that pr produces the rulers of the darkness of this world. The darkness is the darkness of, of not so much unbelief, but of untruth. It's not just I don't believe something, it's I don't have it even to believe. We talked last week about, in, in Romans 13, about the, the works of darkness. And the, the works of darkness, the darkness, absence of the interest of thy word gives light, the absence of God's word gives darkness. And when you don't have truth to, 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 to build your confidence and to put your faith in and to make decisions by, you wind up being ruled by untruth. And these, this, the, these um, rulers of the darkness, people that are running this untrue system, this lie program, and it's spiritual wickedness that's there. Now you need to understand something. As, as people who understand God's Word, as people who appreciate the grace of God, and people who know how to understand the, the Word of God rightly divided, not just generic Christians, but people who, who really get out on the point of, 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 the, of the spear and understand God's Word rightly divided, stand up for God's Word. You, you, when, when you understand who we are that way, we need to understand that the spiritual wickedness of this world has got to, got to focus on who we are and what we're doing. And instead of, when you, when you, if you can just back up and look at the culture out there, and instead of looking at the flesh and blood part of it, you know, the liberal versus the conservative, the, the left wing versus the right wing, the sin and its, its rampantness out there, you need to look at, at what's going on from the perspective of verse 12. And I, I watch this thing, and, and I think, why would the God of this world look at a country like America 
and want to rip it apart. Well, think for a moment. Where in the last 300 years has light, understanding, and truth been developed more than in America? Western civilization, I've said this to you so many times, Western civilization, as we know it, came out of the Dark Ages as a result of the Protestant Reformation. And I'm not talking about Catholicism and Calvinism and that kind of stuff. I'm talking about the Bible-believing people. They were there before the Reformation, but nobody noticed them. They were just like you and I. Be, uh, where do you think we're going to appear in history? Is going to be a footnote? Probably not. If the Lord tarries 500 years, nobody's going to, nobody's going to write big articles about Shorewood Bible Church <laughs> in, in, in its history book. But we're here. And you've had ancestors just like you all down through church history. What gets recorded in history is the institutions. We're not an institution. We're, an, we're a living body of believers. But we've been there, and our ancestors were there. What happened in the Reformation is that some of that information and understanding about, the, about Paul's gospel of, of, of justification by faith alone seeped in to the religious system, got picked up by some, of the, some people who had religious power and clout, and put it on the front burner. And yet that truth was always there, and it was growing. And the, 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 the Bible-believing part, the people that said, here's the Bible, there are people in the 12th century who believe just what you and I believe. You don't hear about them in the institution, but they're there. And that, that began to get a, 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 a powerful group of people that pushed that truth out. The Reformation wound up in England, Across the pond to America, and and from those the, the, those nations, the gospel has gone around the world. The power, the truth of God's word has gone around the world, and not only that, but people began to recover lost understandings and lost truth. And in the late 1800s, early 1900s, late 19th and 20th century, the light of truth from God's word. Dispensational understanding, the recovery of understanding, and the belief in God's Word took off to the place where it affected the cultures of the, of, of the Western world. Now, when I say that, I say that to, to tell you why, I've just explained to you why Satan would look at, 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 at the Western world, especially America, and say, that's an enemy. Not an enemy because of our constitution or because of our, our, our economy, but because of the, the, we're the source of spiritual light. It's been a hotbed where light and understanding has been growing. The economics have given us power to spread the gospel, spread the word of God, spread the truth of the word of God rightly divided around the planet. And what you're seeing as we live, you got Ephesians, right? Come over with me to Isaiah 14. What you're seeing literally is the adversary, and you want to say, why would he take? Why would he want to destroy uh, America or the West? It's because we've been the source of the thing that repulses him the most. It's we've been the source of the thing that he hates the most, and he's striking right at the base of his enemy, the source where truth and light has been has been uh, cultivated. Isaiah 14, verse 12, we read this passage a lot of times about, about, the, 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 about Satan before he became Satan, his original plan. Verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Don't you see that last part of that verse? Here's a passage that's describing, this is a passage doctrinally, is at the second coming of Christ. And he's, going to do, he, he's fixing to take the, the Satan and cast him into uh, the, the, the bottomless pit. And the nation Israel, God's client nation in the earth, going to go into their kingdom, receive all the, begin to see the promises of the kingdom established in them. And they, in, in the earlier part of that chapter, says they, they, they cast a proverb. They mock Satan as he goes down. He says, here was your original plan, and look what's, what you've come to now. So they say, how art thou fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning? That's where you started out. How art thou fallen to the ground? Then they describe, which didst weaken the nations. 
You see, Satan attacks not just individuals, but he's got a bigger strategy than just defeating your life as an individual. He has a strategy of taking the nations of the earth. They already belong to him. They're already under his control. But when one begins or some begin to get out of control from him, his purpose is to weak, weaken them, destroy them, bring them to their knees. And that's in large measure what's happening today. The satanic policy of evil is, 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 is using a fallen culture. Listen, the Western world is teetering on the edge of financial and social ruin today. The satanic policy of evil simply has had enough of Bible-believing, dispensational teaching that emanates from these countries. And what's happening now is a well-planned, orchestrated, listen, the anarchy, the uncertainty, the disarray that results from lost men being put into authority, working under the power of, uh, of, of, of Satan's bidding, you see that everywhere. It's a strange thing for most of us. We've lived in our little world, tended our little nest, our little tree, and we haven't watched what's going on out there. And you lift up your eyes and say, whoa, there's a fire coming, <laughs> and we didn't know it. There's disaster headed our way. Where did it come? And it's like a, it, it shouldn't be a shock to you. You should understand what it is, where it comes from, and what it's about. The three things that Isaiah told Israel, come now, let us reason together. <laughs> and as I've thought about these things, there are three things right now that you need to think about from the Scripture. First, there's the issue of rioting. Then there's the issue of race. And then there's the issue of righteousness. And those three things are critical for you to understand what's going on and how the body of Christ is designed to with, with, withstand those things. Think about the riots that you've seen the last few weeks. Come, come with me to Acts chapter number 5. The first thing you need to remember about, riot, about the riots that went on the last few weeks, and, and it's, you know, you know, it's, somebody says it's an American tradition, but really, really that's not true. Um, <laughs> protests are not wrong. Re redress and resistance against injustice and wrong is the right thing to do. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, it, 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 it's right to do that. The First Amendment, I, I was listening to, I, I, I'm going to confess my sins now. I was listening to CNN. And every time my wife comes in the room, CNN, what are you watching that for? Well, I like to, I like to hear nuts. You know, I like a little comedy every now and then. And... <laughs> I'm watching this guy, he, and it, uh, Cuomo, I don't remember, was, he's a brother, the guy in New York, his governor, it's like frickin' frack, you know, they get on there and talk back and forth, and Fredo, they call him, Fredo is talking about the riots, and he says, who says riots need to be neat? Who says they can't be messy? Uh, he's talking about the protests, not the riots. And I thought, Fredo, didn't, didn't you remember the, the, the First Amendment? The First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. We wish they would be interested in that one. Prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of press or the right of the people, listen, to peacefully assemble. That's why it doesn't need to be messy. To peacefully assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. You see, it's, right, it's, right, it's the right thing to do when you have grievances that the government doesn't listen to, to gather people together and to seek redress. So there's certainly nothing wrong. In fact, it's, the great, it's in the great American tradition to push back against wrong, to push back against pain, and to do it in a way that, that, that your leaders hear you. So protesting is not wrong. Protesting is right. It's the right thing to do. And we have the liberty that many people in the world don't have to do that. It's also biblical. In Acts chapter 5, when the apostles were threatened and told to shut up by the government of their nation, in Acts 5 verse number 21, when they, uh, talking about the disciples, heard that, that they, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught, uh, but the high priest came and they that were with them and call the council together and the senate of the children of Israel. So here's the, le here's the government of the nation Israel, and they say, we told you guys don't do that. 
Don't go down there and preach. Verse 30, 28, he says, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, Well, the powers to be ordained of God. I guess we shouldn't do that. No, what did they say? We ought to obey God rather than man. You see, you can't take one verse of Scripture and say, well, that verse of Scripture says you can't obey that verse. You follow that? That doesn't work. And Peter says, well, look, we're going to obey God and not you because God says to do this. So when someone tells you to do something and it's unscriptural, it's right to resist it. The Apostle Paul in Acts 16, this is a fascinating uh, account here. He's thrown in jail. You remember, he preaches. Uh, verse number 20, um, they, 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 get, they get Paul, and they bring him to the magistrates, saying, these, these, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to, to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, had a mob action, had a riot. And the, and the magistrates run off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And they take them, beat them, put them in jail. Somebody said the only stocks and bonds that Apostle Paul ever had were ones he got in jail. <laughs> and they put him in there. And you know the story how, 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 how he, he's liberated, the Philippian jailer and salvation and so forth. Verse 25. Th 35, I'm sorry. And, and, and it w when it was day, now here's the day after. So they've had a riot. They take Paul and Silas, put them in jail, arrest them, beat them up, bang them around. The next morning, they do just what the riders, what they did with the riders here. They let them out. You, you know, you, uh, it's, uh, that's a great deterrent. So they're going to let Paul out. So verse 35, when, w when it was day, the magistrates sent the, the sergeants saying, let, these men, let those men go. And the, and, and the keeper of the prison told this to Paul, the magistrates are sent to let, let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, they've beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privately? Nay, verily, let them come themselves and fetch us out. I said, whoa. <laughs> he says, hey, they beat us. I'm a Roman. They had no right to do that. What they did was illegal. And they're going to come and apologize publicly and restore our reputation and do it publicly. Now, Paul several times claims his Roman citizenship. It wasn't wrong. Now, by the way, it's interesting he didn't do it when he's getting beat up. They wouldn't have listened then. But now when, when, when the court comes to session, he takes advantage of the law, and he pushes back against the illegal things that are done. My point to you is that's a right thing to do. There's no prohibit prohibitive, either in our culture or in the Scripture, from protesting and seeking redress against wrong. That's something else. But come with me to Psalm chapter number 2. I taught this psalm a couple of weeks ago on Sunday night, so I'm not going to teach the whole thing again. When I watched those, watch the riots, the protests turn into riots. And listen, I understood the protest. It would have been, a, been, been okay to go. Pro the murder of George Floyd was nothing less than murder. And it was wrong. And there's, there's not a person in this room would, would disagree with that, I suppose. You've watched over the last couple of weeks, police officer after police officer after police officer say it was wrong. The guy should never have been a cop on that police force. By the way, it's fascinating. The state of Minnesota has held itself out for five decades as a bastion of liberal progressivism. He's their cop. He's not the cop from some other police department who hate people. He's their, it's their system. They've had five decades to set that system up. Everybody likes to blame somebody else. But it's their, he's their guy. They have a system that allowed a fellow with complaint after complaint after complaint to continue on. And, they got, and that's what you get from that. So just appreciate the fact that it was wrong 
And when people wanted to protest that, you could understand that. But when they started burning, looting, the rioting, the first thing I thought of was this, this verse, Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen, what? Rage. And the people imagine a vain thing. Why is there this rage? Listen, folks, the world is filled with fierce anger. It's a cauldron of unrest and violence and anger at what they think is hurt and injustice, social, economic, political. When, when the world sees themselves being mistreated, they, they respond in rage and anger. And it's really just simply frustrated ambition. They seek something and it doesn't come. The answer to why the heathen rage is one word, sin. That's all it is. Rioting is not simply a political strategy. It's a systemic problem of your old sin nature. It's a response to, the, to, to, to what, what goes on around you, what happens to you, out of an old sin nature that only knows that to do. Strike back. What happens is pain causes frustration. But it always escalates. Frustration, not getting something resolved, will move into anger. And anger, when you brood over something, turns into bitterness. And bitterness causes you to strike out. And that's where the rioting comes from. That's where the, 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 so, the, the violence and the chaos comes from. The reason for, for the why is in verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel again, together against what? Not against evil. Not against sin. But against the Lord. And against his anointed. If you take that passage and go to Acts chapter 4, you'll see that passage is quoted in Acts chapter 4 by the apostles when they're talking about the persecution that they're suffering. Jesus Christ has been crucified, been resurrected, ascends into heaven, sends the Holy Spirit down on his apostles, and they go out and preach, and they fill Jerusalem with their doctrine about the Messiah. And the response that Israel gives back is to persecute and, 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 and to to, to violently respond back to them. And when the apostles get out of one of those persecutions, go back to the, to, to, the, to the Pentecostal church there, they quote this passage and say, this is what's happening to us right now. In other words, this passage prophetically is talking about the, the persecution that comes upon the nation Israel as a result of the crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's a, at the bottom of the rage is a spiritual issue. That's, that's, what, that, that's the point there. The nations, the people imagine a vain, they, they have vain, empty thinking that only produces darkness. Come, come, come with me over to the book of James. And on the way, stop in Romans 1. Just grab Romans 1 as you go, go, past, go past it real quick to the book of James. Where... Where turmoil, where the strife comes from, it's a spiritual issue. It's not so much that you were wrongly treated, it's that you responded to it out of the systemic nature uh, that you have from Adam. By the way, you're going to always have hurts. You're always going to have things happen to you, some worse than others. And the key is always going to be how do you respond to them. But if you don't have truth, and light in your understanding, and all you have is error and darkness that's focused on self, you're always going to respond in a way that's destructive. And violence is a corrupting thing. Because if someone hurts you, and then you strike back in violence toward them, you're doing unto them what they did unto you. And that's where the corruption comes from. That's why there's something deeply corrupting about violence. And it's never going to be the answer. James chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 1, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Now, wouldn't you think the philosophers of the world want the answer to that? 
Why are there wars? Why do you war against yourself? Why do you war against your spouse? Why do you war against your parents? Why does nation war against nation? Come they not hence, even of the lust that war in your members? You see, where the wars out there come from is because there's a war in here. There's a spiritual source to the conflict and to the violence. And when it spills itself over out into the culture, trying to put the culture in, hand, in, 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 in handcuffs doesn't solve the problem. Because the problem's in here. Come back with me to Romans chapter 1. We've looked at this passage over and over and over. Verse number 21. But because when they knew God, it's talking about the nations, how did the heathen become the heathen? They're out there raging in this cauldron of anger. How'd they get that way? Here's the answer. And, and by the way, there is a, there's an idea, there's a, you hear it constantly, you probably would say it, perception is reality. But that's not true. Perception is just how you look at what's happening. Jesus said, thy word is truth. He said, I am the way, the truth. In the Bible, truth is not just two and two is four, not five. Truth in the Bible is the concept of here is the ultimate reality. Here's the basis of all that's real. You're going to find reality. What's real in God's Word? You want to know who you really are? You get that out of God's Word. You don't get that out of your job. You don't get that out of your looks. You don't get that out of your... your, your uh, popularity. You don't get that out of your prowess. You get that. The truth of who you, all those things change. Change and decay all about, I see. Where do you get reality? Where do you get the real skinny? God's Word. And what you do is you go to God's Word and you get the truth on a topic, and then you go out into your life and, and apply reality to the details of life. If you're looking for reality out there in the circumstances, you're like a blind bat flying backwards in a dark cave. You just go against the wall. You're not going to make it. Because that's not where reality is. That's an illusion. That's a false, that's a lie program. And that's what the adversary wants you to do. He wants you to look out there and say, that's what's real, rather what God said. That's what he did with Genesis 3 with Eve. So reality comes out of a clear understanding of God's word rightly divided. If you can't write or divide the word of truth, you can't understand God's word. If you do, listen, everything I'm going to say to you, a good dose of right division out of a King James Bible would help everybody. But you need to appreciate that. I'm, that was all commercial. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. They said, we don't want God telling us what to do. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. We don't want you telling us what to do. We'll, we'll take care of it ourselves. They became vain. When people imagine a vain thing, here it is. They became vain in their imaginations. It's not even fact-based. It's just whew, imaginations, dreaming. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's where darkness comes from. That's where the rage and anger comes. Look down at verse 28. They don't like to retain God in the knowledge that God gave them over to a reprobate, useless, worthless mind to do those things that are not convenient. And being filled with all unrighteousness, there's the rage, Fornication, we, look at all those things, verse 29, 30, 30. You think that's make a world you like to live in? A world filled with unrighteousness, wickedness, fornication, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. A world filled with that is not a, a world. That's a crude, evil, harsh, dangerous world. 
this raging, where did it come from? We don't want to have God, God tell us what to do. We don't want God's truth. We'll develop our own thinking process. And as soon as you try to develop your life or the world, the culture, on your viewpoints, that's where you go. So the reason for the problem, come over with me to chapter 13. The reason for the problems is a spiritual reason. Now notice what, what that, that darkness does. Romans 13, verse 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting. See that? Start in verse 12. I should have got verse 12 first. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Now he's going to describe the works of darkness. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in the first work of darkness is rioting. The first work of rejecting God's word and doing it yourself is chaos that leads to hurt, to anger, to frustration, and ultimately to violence. It'll do that personally, but it does that culturally. And when you're out there trying, you don't have any sound doctrine. If, if righteousness exalts a nation, come with me to 2 Thessalonians 2. If righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people, then the amount of righteous thinking in the population is going to exalt a nation, and the amount of evil era thinking is going to destroy the nation. And that's how Satan weakens the nations. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse number 5, talking about the Antichrist in the future. Okay? Thank God you and I aren't going to go through the seventh week of Daniel. You don't have to worry about taking the mark of the beast. You're not going to get, to, you're not going to get the opportunity if you're saved. Now, if you're lost, you might as well just kick back and take it because, it, it, you know, but... Somebody asked me, wrote a track years ago, said, what to do if you miss the rapture? <laughs> Point number one, don't get excited. You're going to hell anyway. <laughs> I mean, if, you, if, if the fact you're going to hell today doesn't bother you, why would you worry about it after the rapture? You know, that, that, that's, I thought that, that's probably, the, I don't remember anything else in the track, but I thought that was a good point. <laughs> well, here's what's going to happen in the future. He's, Paul talks about it, and he says, verse 5, remember you, rem remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time. The, the mystery, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The program in the culture that's going to produce the Antichrist is already working. It's being held back. The Antichrist can't get, get here. His program can't come to fruition because God's forming the body of Christ. But when that's over, it'll go. But the thing that's going to be that's already working. The culture, the world we live in is already being dominated by the adversary to produce his, his will, his goal. Trying to solve the problems in the culture without the truth of God's word rightly divided will not work. That would have been a place for an amen. <laughs> and you've got to understand that. And the world's looking for answers everywhere. All the platitudes. Let's all just get together. Can't we love everybody? All the rhetoric from the politicians. Laws and money thrown at it and programs and, you know, education is the end. All the guilt manipulation. The critical race theory that's out there now. The, 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 the issue now is white privilege, all that guilt manipulation to try to get their political things done. Listen, the reality, what's real is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what's real, and that's what's the answer. And that's the only answer that's going to operate because it requires you as an individual to exercise your volition in trusting Jesus Christ. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised again the third day, according to the Scripture. Those four realities. You're a sinner, 
Your problem is your sin. The world's problem is sin. The only answer is that God commended his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's the only answer to your sin problem. God raised him from the dead to say his death at Calvary is enough. It's a receipt, and it's all according to the Scripture. It's because God said that's what's real. So when you look at all this stuff, and you see, you see all the pundits and the politics, and they all come with that. Listen, the answers they give aren't true. The answer to bring you from darkness to light, the armor of light, is the gospel. Now, the reason for the riots and the so forth was the issue of race. And that's the focus for the reasons. And listen, the, the issue of, of bigotry and prejudice against people because of the color of their skin or their ethnicity is a, is, is a systemic old sin nature problem. Forget about police and social. I love these systemic problems. You know, a couple of months ago, it was the, the buzzword was uh, existential. He's an existential threat. I get the words out of my mouth. He's an existential threat. And everybody on the news is talking, all of a sudden, politicians, news people, for three weeks talking about existential. And I'm thinking, some of those dudes didn't know that word existed three weeks before that. <laughs> they all got the memo. <laughs> now the memo is systemic threat. There's systemic racism in the police department. There's systemic racism in the culture. Listen, the systemic problem is in your sin nature. The police department, the culture, those are the re arenas where your old sin nature is applying itself. It's not that there aren't some problems there, but the problems aren't in the system. The problem's in you. And the systemic problem is the systemic problem of your old sin nature. And the claims of systemic racism in the police department and the cultures that's just a dodge of the real problem. It's not denying the fact that there's problems in the application, but that's a denial, a dodge of what the real problem is. But listen, if you're lost, you don't know what the real problem is, and when somebody shows it to you, you aren't going to like it anyway. You need to understand, though, we're the body of Christ. We're not walking in darkness like others are. And listen... The way the world is is the way the world is because of the, it's occupied by fallen men whose hearts are desperately wicked. Amen. And it's the way it is because of the broken world we live in. And I'm going to tell you something. This Bible, until Jesus Christ returns to set this world in order, you're not going to see things get any better. Amen. We'll have more legislation obviously. We'll have more eggshell situations to walk on in the culture. Maybe we'll have more opportunities to come to understand one another better. But that's not a solution. And there's not a solution that's going to end the fear, the suspicion, and the anger, and the injustice. If somebody comes along offering you a solution, my advice is simply to be monumentally skeptical. It's easy to offer abstract solutions, platitudes, rhetoric. You've heard, the last two weeks you've heard enough of it to turn your stomach. And I hear those and I say, but you don't mean it. You've said it over and over and over in the past and done nothing about it. And it's just platitudes, just rhetoric. And it doesn't solve the problem. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not hopeless. <laughs> I'm just being realistic with you. The problem is sin. And the jealousy, the envy, the fear, the, the emphasis on the flesh and the circumstances only produces frustration and bitterness and rioting. Can I tell you, when it comes to the issue of, uh, of race, 
My dad used to tell me, he said, Rick, there's only three places there's no racial problem. Heaven, hell, and a believer's heart. Outside of that, hold on to your hat. Well, we're not in heaven. I hope you don't go to hell. But if you're a believer, you have a heart where this issue has been settled. You know, if you go with me to Acts chapter 17, get Acts 17 in one hand and Galatians chapter 3. Acts 17, verse 24. The Apostle Paul is talking to the Athenians, and he says, God that made the world and all, that therein, all things therein, so God created everything. The God that he's talking to you is the creator. Verse 26, hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell upon the face of the, uh, face of the earth and to determine the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. When he says one na made of one blood all nations, nations are identified in Genesis chapter 9 and 10 as borders, language, and culture. When God, the sons of Noah, spread out in the world. You read about it in Genesis 10, and he established them in their nations when God established nationalism. Borders, language, and culture. But they're all, they're diverse, they're different, but they all came from one blood. Now who is that? That's Adam. And what did you get from Adam? For by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So that, sin pass, so that death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. In the book of Romans, twice Paul says there's no difference. One, when he says there's no difference between the Jew and the, for all have sinned. I don't care what the color of your skin, I don't care what the bank account you have, I don't care what your nationality, I don't care how, who you are and, and what you do. The ground is level. You're a sinner. Rags and riches walk together, and the Lord's maker of them all, Proverbs says, we're all in sin. And then he says, there is no difference for the same Lord above all, it's above all, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. There's no difference in salvation. Wherever ever, ever else difference is, the real issue is there. We're all of one blood. We all have the same problem. Now, when you get saved, look at what happens to you. Get Galatians chapter 3. Verse number 26. For ye all are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So how did you become a child of God? Well, you weren't just born. Today, years ago, 100 years ago, this stuff was going around, and it was called the social gospel. And then it was the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man. Today, it's called being, being woke to becoming a social warrior. That's the popular term today. You've got to be woke <laughs> And you've got to be a social warrior. And the term today is everybody, are, all men are image bearers. And what they mean by that is fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man. We're all equal. We're all the children of God. But you know, that ain't so. We're all the children of the wrong God until verse 26. Until you make a personal choice to trust the God of the Bible, the creator of heaven and earth, to be your savior. And you trust Jesus Christ to be your Savior. You personally rely upon Him to be the Savior that He died and rose again for you to be. You're in the wrong family. You get in His family by verse 26. We're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's not water baptism. You know that. That's not religion. Forget that stuff. That's designed to hoodwink you into something else. But you're baptized, God, the Holy Spirit takes you and puts you into Jesus Christ. You're put into living union with Him. Now what happens there in Christ is neither Jew nor Gentile. Now isn't that interesting? Bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. You're put into a body of believers where there's a complete total abandonment of social status and an equality in Christ. God is as rich to you in Jesus Christ as he is to the dude sitting next to you. He's as rich to me in Jesus Christ as he is to you and you to me. 
this complete, total equality. More than that, there's no circumcision, uncircumcision, bond or free. If you look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, you can write that by that verse, where, where, he, where he puts it like this, where there is neither Greek nor, nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, that's all the social distinctions, racial distinctions, bond or free. All those things are abandoned in Christ. And literally what he's done is he says to Corinthians, there's Jew, there's Gentile, and there's the church. We're literally a new species of humanity. We have a new identity. I don't want to say a new nationality because that's not right, but we're, 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 a new, we're a new creature. He calls us the one new man. And that concept of that classless world in Christ, that blew the minds. It just blew the circuitry of the people of the first century. It literally shook the Roman Empire to its very foundation. Because here's a group of people who, are, who, who live, who call each other brother and sister and treat each other like they're the same, and yet in every other way, socially, economically, politically, they weren't the same. Different races, Jew and Gentile. Listen, in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, he says, in time past you were circumcision. You were called the circumcision, you called the uncircumcision by that which is called the, you know the verse, Ephesians 2, 11. Two different, I mean, that's a racial distinction that God made when he said Israel aside. And they call each other the contempt, the enmity. has always been there because of the old sin nature. The animosity, the hatred, the violence between groups. All of a sudden just, you got a group of people over here that aren't that way. All that racial hostility goes away. All that economic hostility goes away. All that social class. You know about a class-driven world? The first century was that. And now you have a group of people emerge that are, that are a family. Jews, Gentiles, slaves, free, rich, poor. No matter what. All wiped out. And they're eating together. They're working together. They're greeting one another with a holy kiss. They're raising their children together. They're taking care of one another. They're marrying each other. And that literally shook the Roman Empire to its foundations. And one of the reasons in the first three centuries, you hear so much about the, the church growing exponentially in those first three centuries, had nothing to do with going back to Pentecost. It had to do with being who they were. And this new culture, this new identity that's being created in a world that had never heard the name of Jesus Christ until that century in a world that had never heard about the gospel of grace until then. And when Paul went out there, you think about that, he's the first guy, he's the only dude who knew this stuff. <laughs> I think about that sometimes. People say, well, if nobody in my town believes any of this. Well, there was a time when Paul said, nobody in the world knew this. And yet, because of, of the power of the gospel, all of a sudden, the, there are two things that happened in the first three centuries. Number one, they produced a culture among the believers of unity and oneness that did away with all of the class distinctions. And number two, in the second and third century, there was a great pandemic, about 20 years of pandemic in Rome, thousands of people dying every day. And it was the Christians giving themselves to love and good works that produced a witness. And we'll talk about this later on. But these things that it had nothing to do with anybody, let's go back to Pentecost, the first century. No. Not hardly. Listen, what happened, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 12, that being baptized into Christ, look at what he, how he says it. Because it's important that you get the, 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 the idea that's going on here. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, starting verse 12, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are, are one body, so also is Christ. Your physical body has all kinds of members, and yet it's one body. And that's how the body of Christ is. Why? For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles. It doesn't matter your racial, religious status. When you trust Christ, all of us are put into that one body. 
whether we bond or free, and have been made, been, been all made, all made, all of us, to drink of that one spirit. Bad doctrine, people that don't rightly divide the word, are no help in understanding, overcoming the racial bigotry, the social d d distress, the hurt. They're of no help in understanding that because they don't have the answer which is in God's word rightly divided. It's in who God's made us as the one new man. Only Jesus Christ can live his life. He gave his life to us, for us at Calvary so he could give his life to us when we trusted him so he, then he could live his life through us as we walk by faith and an understanding of who we are. And that's the only way his life, everything else would be an outward forced shell. The, the answer to racism that's being promoted today among evangelicals, big evil they call it. I call it the evangelical industrial complex. The answer to, to the social problems is what's called being a woke social warrior. That's the big term today. I asked some folks the other day, and nobody had heard of that. I don't know if you've heard about it. If you haven't, God bless you. Be simple concerning evil and wise concerning that which is good. But he, here's the way they do it, and I want, you to, I want you to get this. Here's an article. It's by a guy, guy by the name of Tim Keller. He's uh, from Manhattan, Riverside Church, and Man, Redeemer Church in, in Manhattan. He is one of the titular heads of the social warrior movement. Uh, Russell Miller is another, uh, uh, another one. Uh, he's the Southern Baptist guy. And these guys, you can call the names all day long. It doesn't matter. But here, here's what he says. This, this, um, this article, he starts out. In Galatians 2.14, that's where Paul rebukes Peter for leaving the, the Gentiles. Remember that? Say yes. Thank you. Liar. <laughs> Lie to me. Just, in Galatians 2.14, Paul deals with Peter's racial pride and cowardice by declaring that he was not living in line with the truth of the gospel. And what these people say is that the reason in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, that the Pentecostal church only focused on Israel. As far as Acts eleven nineteen, they go out preaching to none but the Jews only. And their answer for that is because Peter and the apostles were racist. Now that's, you'll hear that everywhere you go in this stuff if they're talking... And they say, we, we can't be racist. Now, I don't understand. They want to go back to Pentecost to get the Pentecostal power, but the guys that they say had the Pentecostal power were racist because they only went to the Jews. And you say, hello, anybody awake? Not many. Now, you know, I mean, when I said that, you laugh because you know that the reason the apostles didn't go to anybody but the Jews is not because they were racist. It's because they understood what God was doing at the time. It's Israel's program. By the way, if they were racist, Jesus Christ told them, repentance and remission of sin should be preached in all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Was he a racist? According to that guy, he is. Because he made the distinction. In Acts 2, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, speaks as the Spirit gave him utterance. And three times he says, I'm only talking to Israel. You men of Judea, you men of Israel, little house of Israel here. I'm not talking to you Gentiles. They say he's a racist. You go, huh? They say the reason that they had to raise up the apostle Paul and send him to the Gentiles because these racist apostles wouldn't go. That is as close to blasphemous nonsense, malarkey, I remember years ago, you remember when Khrushchev came, and you guys not old enough, back in the 50s, Nikita Khrushchev uh, visited the United States and President Eisenhower took him around the country and showed him things. And as an old guy on the radio, he, Carl McIntyre, he was uh, a real anti-communist American crusader. And somebody asked him about it, and he says, uh, 
Well, I think that what the politicians are doing is they're stepping in the stuff that Nikita Khrushchev was stepping over in the cow pasture. Obviously, you don't, you don't know about cow pastures. How many of you know what a meadow muffin is? Uh, a couple of you. Cows in the pasture, mark, go out in the parking lot and look how the geese tag our parking lot. The little gifts they leave you out there, same thing. Anyway, I, that illustration went like that, didn't it? <laughs> the point is, this is nonsense. And it's not just nonsense, it's dangerous nonsense. Because the, the reason these people don't, they have, they have power, political power, religious power, position, but they don't have an answer. And the reason they don't have an answer isn't because they aren't trying, that is, they, they don't see the problem, they do. They don't have the answer because they don't understand how to study God. They're trying to bring in the kingdom. That king will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And they think that means political, economic, and social, uh, and religious force. An external thing. They don't understand what God's doing today. And when you don't understand how to study your Bible rightly divided, you're going to wind up in that kind of thing. I'm saying to you, the answer is in the gospel of the grace of God. The only place you'll find the gospel of your salvation is through the ministry that God gave you through the Apostle Paul. That thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. How is it that that happened? He He's forming the church, the body of Christ. Where do you learn about that? That's what Paul says. This thing was a mystery. It's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. It's not that kingdom program. It's something new. And you find it in the revelation of Christ to him. And when you see that, then you understand what the answer to these kind of problems. It's in the gospel. We're not bringing in the kingdom today. And all the foolish talk about doing it only demonstrates that you're impotent when it comes to facing real problems. And the reason our culture today in America and in the West is the way it is is because when the opportunity to understand that and grow in it was there and the church turned its back on it, light rejected becomes lightning. And we're living in a moment when the fruit of all that, for years you've heard the politicians say we're going to kick the can down the road. State of Illinois for decades, somebody else is going to pay the pensions. Well, here you are. You're going to pay it. You watch what happens to our tax structure in the next year. Because they've got pensions that politicians in the past promised but did not make provisions for. And it's bankrupted us. Well, spiritually, you're reaping those things. The answer's in the gospel. That brings us to righteousness. And I'll have to talk about that next week. I knew I wouldn't get through. She asked me, we'll go. I gave her three pages of notes. She said, I'm going to do all that? I said, no, I've pulled down about half of them so far. Last night after I, the wedding and things, I was, I, I was looking on Facebook. I got a little note. And I thought, wow, this is, this, is, this is what I was looking for to share this with you. There's a brother in Detroit, uh, Buffalo, New York, Pastor Leroy Reed. He's a friend of ours. He spoke in our summer conference. He pastors the Grace Church in, in Buffalo, New York. And uh, Leroy is an African-American. And he has good ministry there. He, he put this, this note. I, I, I'm going to read a part of it. It's too long for me to read all of it. In 1984, Detroit police officers uh, Sumling and, and Lowe wounded my soul with a vicious, violent arrest that they performed on me, which led to my overnight incarceration. They told me I was under arrest for possession of a stolen vehicle. I told them it was my vehicle, the 1982 Cadillac DeVille that I'd purchased uh, in New York State before I moved to Detroit. I was 21 years old. Then he describes how they said, no, you're too young. You can't own that car. It can't be yours. You've stolen it. The, the paperwork's a fraud. They beat him up, throw him in jail, leave him in jail overnight. And uh, the next morning, they do what the guy did with Paul. They come and say, okay, you can leave now. And he says, well, but we'll, you can't just let me. They said, look, kid, you better shut up or we'll find some reason to arrest you, keep you. And, and the story is horrendous. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's his experience. And uh, li listen, when you hear the, the rhetoric that says uh, we're colorblind, uh, or there's only one, human, there's only one race, the human race. You hear people say that? There's only one race, the human race. 
that's, that's empty rhetoric to a man like Leroy. Any black person knows that what you're saying isn't true. In their experience, they know that it isn't true. That's just those empty platitudes that people who are trying to avoid responsibility. Okay? Now, I read you that because I want to get down here. It made me feel so insignificant. By the way, they threw him out. He went to four different lawyers. None of them say, you can't take the case. Just be glad they didn't arrest you and go on about your business, kid. And so he's, he, you know, you'd be, think of how you'd feel. if, if and, all, and by the way, the two officers were African Americans. So it's not just, it's the racial stuff, but it's also the systemic police, policing of it. It made me feel so insignificant, as if my life and well-being was insignificant at 20 years old. There's so much more that I could say as it pertains to how that incident, along with so many others I've witnessed, have affected my mindset. However, there's good news. As for my soul is concerned, one day I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sins and that he was buried, that he rose again for my justification. He got saved. Now listen. Now, by the grace of God, I've acquired so much joy that the bitterness of the past and present events can't take any residence in my soul. It's God's property now. You understand what he just said? That's the answer. You may read that to you again. I wrote him and said, that's well put. Now, by the grace of God, I've acquired so much joy that the bitterness of the past and present events can't take up residence in my soul. It's God's property. That's the answer. The answer is not going to be in your flesh. The answer is not going to be in justifying yourself or condemning somebody else. The answer is going to be getting outside of you into him and appreciating who God's made you in him. The way you live righteously and godly in Christ Jesus, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. His life living through us. Living in an understanding of who you really are in Jesus Christ, in the small details of your life. Live in the reality of the truth. Not the changing circumstances and situations out there. And then, be ready as a believer to do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. You and I need to be on the lookout, not just to satisfy ourselves. Not just to get a big new TV or have a nice vacation or have, have the next set of clothes. We need to be on the lookout. That's who we are. That's what the body of Christ is created for. To be on the lookout for the hurting and the people who have needs because that's where you can go love and do love and good works like God love and, and take that gospel message that fills the hearts of the hurting pain of the world with a joy that doesn't allow bitterness and anger to take residence because it belongs to the Lord. The body of Christ is made, was made for a time like this where you are. Now, that's the big picture. You're the little tree. So you be who you are in your little world so that Christ lives there. The world we live, the culture is changing. So see, it's going to be different in, in a lot of ways, but the place that won't be different is right here. The culture out there, normal is different. But the local church, the body of Christ, will, will always be doing the same thing. If you never trusted Christ, pass him death to life. You've never had that that joy, unspeakable and full of glory that can fill your heart and 
push out all the rest. Bitterness about your past, bitterness about your, your family, your friends, your neighbors, somebody's done something to you. All those that have failed you, those that are a joy that says, this is what's real, not that. And now I can go minister to people in those circumstances. You can have that this morning, right where you sit. You don't have to go anywhere, do anything, move a muscle, change, change your life. All you have to do is trust God's Son who provided that life for you. It'll come into your life because it's His life. And when you trust Him, and it'll be everlasting life. Lasts for all eternity, but it begins now. And that joy that will be ours in eternity can be yours right now because you have a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you never trusted him, you need to do that today. If you've got a question about that, people around here will be happy to talk with you. You don't need us, though. You need him. You don't have to go anywhere, talk to anybody. God looks at your heart. Tell him you trust his son. And for those of us that are saved, let's just go be who we are. Get our focus off ourselves and on to who we are in Christ. Okay?